and gentlemen, wel once again, welcome to the 2013 uh, Nagios World Conference. Up next is an intro to network monitoring using Nagios Network Analyzer and NSTI. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for Spencer. Thank you. So uh, for those of you that I haven't talked to already, I know I've spoken with several of you. Um, I'm one of the Nagios employees. I work on the tech team. Um, I'm a pretty active participant in DEF CON and other um, open source projects and things, uh, a lot of OWASP and stuff like that. So um, security, some of the network monitoring, SNMP traps type stuff, um, knowing what's going on in my own network is something that I find very interesting. And this just kind of goes off of that. Um, today we're going to try and talk about some SNMP basics. Um, I know this, especially if you're coming from Sam's talk, we're going to try and not get into too many little tiny um, basics and stuff, but just go over some SNMP basics because it does seem to be a, a pretty big issue lately. Um, go over some of the NSTI stuff, which is not an official product, but it is something that we do offer, and uh, Nick has been working on a new um, version of it. Go over some NNA stuff and uh, possibly give you some ideas of how you can kind of integrate the two or three um, as a, a way of better monitoring your network and, and getting more correlation between the products that you're using. So what is SNMP? If you don't already know, it's supposedly a simple network management protocol. Um, really, not that simple. <laughs> it's basically an application layer protocol that allows you to query your remote network devices, uh, different OSs and systems, and find information on them. Um, it works using what's called OIDs and MIBs, or OIDs, MIBs and traps and gets and all sorts of other fun things. Um, and we'll get to those here in a second. The basic terminology of is what we're going to kind of go through for the next five minutes or so, hopefully at most. Um, to start off with, the manager is actually the portion that would be running on NSTI or running on your Nagios XI system that's collecting your traps or, or running the gets, um, get requests against your systems. Um, the agents are going to be an actual agent that's running on a remote system or your network switch and router, something along those lines. Um, the other big, big point that does get noticed but does get overlooked at times too is that there are three different versions. There's version one, um, which is the first standard. Um, I don't recall when it came out, but it was pretty basic, worked just fine, and it is very similar to version two. Um, version two, which is also called V2C, um, allows some enhancements, mainly performance, some security improvements, and like you, um, um, some things with uh, the community string specifically, and uh, bulk get requests, which is a huge improvement for some certain things that we're actually looking at implementing with uh, XI itself and some of our network stuff that we're already doing. Um, version 3 really isn't any different from version 2. There's no major, major improvements other than security. Um, it allows you to do cryptography or secure your communications, um, and it allows you to do username password authentication and actually verify who you're getting stuff from and who you're sending it to. Um, so it does, it does offer some nice things, but uh, again, not super easy in any case. Um, so MIBs, what are these MIB things that I'm talking about in OIDs? Um, MIBs are a collection of OIDs and references on how your system can use them. Um, pretty, pretty basic idea, if, if you understand what I'm saying. Um, basically, the OID is an identifier that works like an address for telling your SNMP GET request or your SNMP trap that's being sent to your manager um, what it's referencing and what data is actually contained within it. Um, so the three major types that you're, you're going to be working with, there are plenty of others um, that are kind of subsets of these three, are get requests, 
um, responses to the GET request and traps. Get, re GET requests, as you might expect, are the manager talking to the agent and saying, hey, what do you have at this o OID? Here's my community string, you know, just send me back the data. Um, the response comes back, and, and the one thing I should point out that I do point out in the, the next slide is that all of this is um, asynchronous. The, er, sorry, traps are asynchronous. Um, all of this is synchronous, but it's over UDP. So it's not a continual connection like TCP. Um, so when we get to firewalls in a second here, it does throw some people for loops. Um, traps don't ever get a GET request. You set up what traps you want to send from your device, and it decides, oh, I hit this event. In the case of Windows, which we'll look at later, um, you can do Windows event monitoring. So if you're looking to monitor your, your logs on a Windows box and send certain ones to your trap handler, um, you can do that. And you don't have to worry about your Nagios box or NSTI box going, hey, Windows, what do you got for events for me? Windows just sends it off to them. Um, so again, like I said, we, we're going to get to some firewall stuff. It's pretty basic. Um, Port 161 is basically what you're going to be using if you're doing gets and responses. Uh, if you are using version 3 and cryptography specifically, it will uh, use 10.161 instead of just 161. And traps uh, do change it up. I'm not entirely sure why my guess would be so that they don't uh, get confused uh, by the system itself, but they go on 162 or 10.162. So. Pretty, pretty simple there to add in the right rules for that. Um, as far as what actually runs on different systems, Linux and Windows, you can both use um, NetSNMP for managers. For agents, the uh, Linux uses SNMPD, SNMPTT, and TrapD. And Windows itself just has the SNMP service, with, which both contains its uh, agent and its trap generator. Um, as far as XI goes, and a fair amount of other products like Cacti and such, um, we do use MRTG, and that's a fantastic way for especially network devices and other devices that uh, um, work along the same lines to collect uh, traffic information, if you will, and specific bits of information uh, via SNMP and condense it into RRDs. Um, so like I said, traps, trap D, SNMP, TT, pretty, pretty basic stuff. Um, kind of along the same lines of basics, uh, the, the three things we're going to talk about today for the three main products, NNA, NSTI, and, and SNMP in general, um, I'm going to try and go over where the configuration files are, where the logging is, and some basic troubleshooting. Um, it seems to be a pretty big um, want of people lately to use SNMP, which is great. It's, it's a pretty awesome protocol when it works correctly. But uh, some of the time, like I said, it's not really so simple. <laughs> um, so on any of your XI systems or any of your Linux, Unix systems, these, this is most likely where you're going to find your various configuration files. Um, if you're worried about agents, you just need to worry about SNMPD. And um, as far as traps go, SNMPTT and TrapD are just managers that collect them. They don't actually send them out. Um, that SNMPD should handle that for you as well. Um, one more set of important inf of locations just for traps and NSTI specifically is going to be where your MIBs actually get loaded. Um, when you put them in here, Especially for a Nagios system, they should be owned by root and by user root and group Nagios. That way, both Apache and the Nagios systems or users can access them. Um, reason being, you can make life really easy on yourself and use XI to upload them to your system, and it'll auto process the, tra the traps into the correct config files if you have it set up correctly. Um, there are some permission changes that need to be made before you can do that, though. So it's a little bit of a nicety that, that's there that helps out. So why do you care about all of this? Unless you already know what SNMP is and you're already doing this and going, OK, great, he's boring me. I want to go to sleep now, um, which after two days of conference, you may well want to do. The, uh, 
the basis of SNMP is that it's virtually an agentless system. Um, very few times, if, especially if you're looking at um, monitoring your network switches and routers and firewalls and things of that nature, um, you're not going to need to install anything on those systems. You're probably not going to need to enable much. You're probably just going to have to do some basic configuration, say who can talk to it, what um, community string, or if you're using version 3, what crypto and what username and password you're allowing. Um, as far as that goes, that's probably the easiest portion of it, and uh, it, it really isn't too terrible. Um, and the other big thing is, especially regarding Nagios, there are a whole heck of a lot of plugins that use SNMP. You can find stuff for BlackBerry servers, for Windows servers, uh, checkpoint firewalls, you name it, and someone's probably got an SNMP um, system for it, or plugin for it, because so much does support it. Um, moving on from hopefully the not so semi boring portion, we'll start talking about some NSTI and NNA here. Um, NSTI is our Nagios SNMP trap interface. And basically, it allows you to collect and dump. Um, well, it doesn't collect them, SNMPTT and TRAPD do. And they dump them to a MySQL database, which allows you to actually view these records in a pretty easy way. Um, Nick Scott, who's presenting over on one of his agents that he's been working on for the past couple months right now, um, has made the interface basically all on his own. Um, I poke and prod him quite often, and so do several of our customers. Um, he is, or, or no, he's still in the process of making a new version. If I go back a slide here, this actually is uh, 2.5 or version 3. We haven't decided on a number yet, but um, this is the basic setup so far. Um, it's got most of the the workings that all the previous versions did. It's much cleaner, and there's uh, very little actual um, um, dependencies and issues with it like one or two of the previous ones have had. Um, like I said, NSTI uses SNMPTT and TRAPD to collect the files. They dump them to MySQL, and it displays them for you. Um, it's super lightweight, and it's quick, and it makes it so that you can view these traps without pulling your hair out trying to look at logs for days. Um, some of the important places as far as logs go, um, it does not currently have its own log file. It is something that I've been talking with Nick about doing um, because it would probably be helpful to understand why NSTI may not be working directly from what it thinks as opposed to what Apache or MySQL think. Um, but generally, so far, we found that these are enough to figure out what's going on. Um, Configuration files, depending on where you're looking, the reason I bring this up is because version 2 and 1 and 3 use the same, or use different directories. Uh, 1 and 3 use user local NSTI. Um, the version 2, which is the current newest one, uses user local um, Nagios TI. So keep that in mind. You can technically run all three at the same time if you really wanted to. I wouldn't suggest it, but you can. Um, so some potential issues you can run into. There are quite a few. These are probably three of the biggest ones that we've seen in the last six months or so, and this is not specific to NSTI. This is with traps in general. Um, if you're finding that SNMPTT is not logging traps, you've probably, it's probably either that it's not receiving them, you've got a firewall issue, or it's not sending them, UDP is not getting there for some reason, um, or your spool directory it doesn't have the correct permissions for TRAPD to actually dump them into. Um, there are some other specific SNMPTT settings um, that go in the INI file that it can work without them. It works much better with them, specifically like putting it in daemon mode and some other things like that. Um, MySQL issues, it's MySQL. It's really not too troublesome as long as it's done correctly. But the main files that you have to worry about configuration for that are just the um, NSTI CFG and the SNMPTT uh, INI. Um, the only other big one that seems to be coming up lately is uh, traps not sending to XI, which 
isn't terribly difficult, but it's kind of uh, infuriating when you can see that they're coming in and you're still not getting your NSTI or XI to actually pick up the traps and go, hey, I got them here. You know, they actually do work. Um, the biggest thing for that has been um, the trapd.conf actually contains how you're, ex well, contains part of how you're expecting to handle um, traps, where they're supposed to go, and specifically the trap hand or SNMP trap handler.py is uh, a big part of that and is something that, uh, well, let's not let that unplug, um, is something that uh, tends to get overlooked a little bit. So what can you actually do with this, right? I mean, I'm, I'm blabbering at you about this whole SNMP stuff and traps and NSTI, but I haven't actually told you what, it, what you can use it for. Well, it's, it's really nice, especially if you've got a lot of devices sending in traps so that you can correlate that data. You can run filters against it and say, hey, you know what, I only care about stuff that is referencing this particular firewall rule that's being hit from, from my various border firewalls. Um, you can also use it to, <coughs> excuse me, to feed uh, traps to and from XI and specifically to core as services. So if you've got, again, a firewall or a Windows box or you, know, you want to monitor event logs, um, you can do that as a service in XI and have either NSTI forward them after it's collected them or have uh, XI forward back to NSTI in Trap D as um, th things get acknowledged or things go critical and actually happen. Um, there are some components in XI that will allow you to do that. Um, and the other big ones are probably network device changes. So if an interface goes down, instead of waiting for your Nagios checks to pick it up in five minutes, you can get it pretty much instantaneously because the device will tell you itself, hey, this interface is down. Um, so specifically, ooh, yeah, that did come out a little gross. Um, one of the things that I use it for at home is collecting my Windows event logs. My, uh, my Exchange server at home likes to do some funky things occasionally and back up the queue and not actually keep sending mail to my phones and other things like that like it's supposed to. So what I've done is gone in and actually, um, oh, I guess service restarts is next, but um, gone in and actually told it to log when someone logs in. And specifically, I don't allow remote desktop. I use log me in. Log me in is nice enough that they have Windows events that actually do get logged into the event log. And so you can tell the event log to SNMP trap um, handler that Windows provides. And that it's in all versions of Windows at this point. Although Microsoft is trying to deprecate it. Um, you can tell it, hey, when you see this, send it off. So every time I log in or one of my friends that actually has access to it um, logs into my server, I see, hey, they logged in. They're at this IP address. They came in with this username. Um, if I wanted to, I could set up an XI alert that sent me an email and said, hey, this guy's logging in again. What's he doing on your system? Is he going to go break your email again? <laughs> um, that wasn't supposed to go that far. There we go. Um, another one I've done, again, on the same lines of the Exchange server. In this case, it's actually showing the SNMP uh, service being restarted on a Windows box. You can set it specifically for any services to show restarts or um, unexpected shutdowns, things of those nature, or of that nature. Um, so it, it's, it's really helpful. And you can kind of, depending on what you've got set up, without having to go dig through the Windows event logs that are you know, 10 million lines long and really not all that detailed in some cases, you can kind of follow a path of what's going on in your system from startup to shutdown or startup to issues um, just using traps if you've got things set up correctly and if your product support it. Uh, getting on to NST, or NNA, as we like to call it internally, Nagios Network Analyzer, um, this is a pretty sweet product that uh, Nick and Jake have been working on for, uh, I don't know, a while or so. Um, I know we did have a beta um, probably a little after last year's conference, if I recall correctly. And uh, the big difference now is RRDs have been compressed. They're 
vastly superior as far as data storage um, pre compared to the previous version. Um, the interface, if you saw it before, is completely rewritten and redone. And uh, again, it, it's pretty light on your system. But uh, what is NNA? Well, it's a flow collector, as if you came from um, Sam's talk or if you saw next yesterday. Um, it collects network flows from your various network devices or an agent on a Windows box. Um, so what do you do with this stuff? What, what's the point? Well, you can correlate network traffic, again, with traps and things like that. You can say, hey, you now this guy logged onto my system. I don't know what IP this is. What other stuff did he do or, or what other... Um, what, what information or, or things happened on my network while he was there. And you can use NNA to actually look at, oh, well, between you know, 11.15 and 11.45 p.m., the system he was on accessed these websites, or these IP addresses at least, um, sent this data over this port that was open on the firewall, and, and you know, he sent out three gigs of data. You can't really tell what that data is. It doesn't give you that level of detail. Um, possibly, but it at least can give you an idea of, hey, something happened. Um, so again, along with the important things to look at on those systems, uh, in this case, NNA is pretty darn simple. Um, we put it in user local Nagios NA. Uh, it's got all of your files there. There's very little c to configure outside of um, making sure that NFCAPD is actually started. Once that's started, you can collect things um, and get all your sources sending in, and it's uh, really pretty easy. So, unlike Andy and other people, I'm just going to go break the rule and bring up a live demo for you. <laughs> oh, well, I suppose uh, there's one other guy in the room that did. And yours went well enough. We'll see if mine will work. <laughs> Aside from my Windows telling me to activate. No big deal. Happens with a fresh install. Um, so this is our demo at the office. Um, you can log into this at any point in time that you want. Specifically, this is NNA. We do not have an NSTI demo open to the public at this point. Um, it, you can download and install the current 2x version, and we should have the 3 or 2.5x version out soon enough, um, but it is not available yet. Um, but here you can kind of see, okay, we've got Nagios checks, or in this case NNA checks. Um, there aren't any set up for this system, but if you did have any, you could see you know, what your checks are, what they've done in the past, um, what their current statuses are, and... Uh, Right, not mirrored. <laughs> We've also got a nice little dashboard of just what's your system doing? You know, how, how heavily is it used at the moment? Apparently, that's not giving me bars. Thankfully, I also have this. So like I said, I use LogMeIn at home. Um, it's a great little tool. And here you can see my system's a little pegged at the moment kind of happens when you run lots of Nagios systems on one VM that's really not got a whole lot of uh, resources behind it. And apparently it really doesn't like me because I've been logged into this for the past couple hours and, and pushing quite a lot of data through it. Um, so aberrant behavior is basically uh, over a period of time, NNA is smart enough to say, okay, this is how much data I'm expecting. These are the ports I'm expecting to see used. And if it's seeing things that don't fit that model, it will actually go in and tell you, hey, hey, you got something wrong here. And so you can pretty quickly see, okay, my main server that I'm on right now really doesn't like me, but my ASA is perfectly fine. It doesn't have any issues. It's just happy to be there. Um, and then along the same lines of showing the system dashboard. You can see all your different sources if I had more than two. I'm just going to jump back here just to show some of the other stuff. And if we want to run some more advanced queries on my own network, we certainly can. Um, but getting sources set up is, is really basic. I'm not even going to walk through it because I have a feeling Sam did. 
Um, sorry, I didn't watch his talk if, if he didn't. And I should mention, if you guys have any questions, if you want me to describe anything or run anything in particular, I'm more than happy to. Um, just raise your hand and, and we'll get the mic out to you and we can do that. Um, but yeah, setting up a source, you can see it's, it's pretty darn simple. Um, I don't have one internally that I can set up at the office at the moment or at home, so we'll just leave it blank. But you can set your time frames, and this is actually, this is the biggest part of what or, or how much space your RD is going to end up taking up. Um, going back to my home system, I've actually got seven days of detailed traffic on both of these, and they take 18 megs. Now, I watch Netflix. Um, I have little brothers with Xboxes and Playstations, and uh, we pretty well use our internet connection. Now, is it an enterprise network? No, we're not pushing you know, 100 meg or, or a gigabit connection, but for the Comcast connection we have at the moment, there's quite a bit of traffic going through it, and 18 megs is pretty good. It, it handles it like a champ. Or, yeah, 18 megs per RRD, I should say. Um, <coughs> once you've got sources set up, you can go in and further correlate your data. And so in this case, the two sources that we've got set up in the demo are actually two different border routers that we've simulated. Um, they're not actual systems, so if you expect some cool, funny data, I'm sorry, it's not there. You'll probably find it on my home stuff instead. <laughs> but what you can do with source groups is basically just combine the RRDs into not another RRD, but it will use the shortest time frame. So if I had one of my sources set to seven days and one set to 24 hours, it would look at both in 24-hour increments and just allow you to kind of correlate the data again between them. So you could take all of your border firewalls and say, hey, I want to see all the data from all of them at the same time and see, okay, are they all getting hit by this one IP address on uh, you know, port 22 for SSH? Or are all of our IAS servers internally um, getting hit with a lot of SharePoint traffic or, or different web traffic, things like that, which hopefully your IAS servers would be because that's kind of what they're designed for. Um, so unfortunately, this data on the demo is kind of boring. Um, it's pretty flat. They're, the simulation that we've got running at the moment doesn't really provide um, a whole lot of interesting things. But you can kind of see, again, just like with sources themselves, source groups, you can run reports and queries, which uh, reports and queries get into some of the more advanced features of NNA. Um, I'm sure Nick did a fair amount of talking on that. If he didn't, um, I'm sorry, because it's pretty awesome stuff. By default, the reports allow you to pick a top number, top n number of uh, um, sources or destinations that you want to see. So in this case, this report pulls the top talkers, as we call it which is basically the most data used or the most connections made. Um, we can go in here and also tell it, oh, let's pull top talkers by source port. And in this case, it's actually sorting by what the source port was instead of the source IP and saying, okay, we've got, uh, I don't know, some billion number of packets it looks like um, from 3306, whatever that may be. So you can, again, you can kind of see how just by creating a source group, if, if you're looking at an individual source and you go, well, you know, why is this the only one that's seeing this? you can go into source groups or views, which we'll s touch on in a second, and actually do much more correlative, or get much more correlative data throughout your network and throughout various places. Um, queries opposed to reports are not limited in really any way. Um, you can do some of the standards ones that we have, which I'll have to grab from the queries page, um, but basically you can set up any of the various queries and save them. In this case, I'll just run 
our botnet um, traffic one, which looks at some common ports and some common IP addresses and says, hey, is any of this out there? Um, and are we seeing it on any of our networks? At this point, we don't have anything. Um, that might be something I'll end up adding to the uh, demo server just to say, okay, now we can run a report against this and actually show what data is there. Um, I think if I actually look on mine, go to queries, I believe I was seeing some P2P traffic the other day. We'll see if this will pull back up. And yep, I would like it from my gateway. Yeah, sorry, my, my system's a little slow at home. Like I said, it's, uh, it runs a little heavy. But you can see, okay, I've got 68 bytes from today at about 2 o'clock that are com going into my network or trying to come into my network from somewhere. Um, now it's not saying, the, the, the one problem that I've noticed that uh, I've talked with Nick about correcting is that it does not correctly show, and flows in general, we found this to be the case, um, if it's an external source coming into your board or firewall, router, whatever it may be, um, it will not properly show the internal IP address that it's coming to. So if one of your workstations is requesting a, a certain website, you'll see your workstation hit port 80 um, to your router. Uh, in that case, you may actually see it request um, the full external IP address of the, the external system. Um, but when it comes back, that connection is actually going to show it to your, your firewall, and then it's going to show your firewall to your system. Um, that is something I've spoken with Nick about, adding in as an additional um, set of features to basically say, hey, this came in at the exact same time. It's a continuation of a flow between two separate devices and we're now going to allow you to combine it and, and give you the option to turn that on or off um, and say, hey, we know that this is the same stuff. Um, so you can just see, you can run and look for various ports, um, IP addresses, source destination stuff. Um, the aggregate by is just like when we were looking at reports and, and we changed it to top destination port. Um, this is how it's actually sorting your data and, and what specific data you want to see. So down below you saw that it was showing IP addresses and that's what it's looking for. Destin it's um, sorting it all by destination and source IP. Um, doo -doo -doo -doo. So one of the things that NNA and NSTI both allow is sending checks to Nagios. So you can actually, this would be the name of the service that you're sending, and you can do source or source group just like you can with reporting and querying, and choose whatever you would like. Views are another thing we'll step into. Oh, right. And what you can do is set up bytes, number of flows, number of packets, or the actual speed that it's currently using um, as the check settings. So if you're used to, um, for instance, one thing that I've done at home is I, for the last couple nights, um, I started watching Netflix at night. And I noticed that my XI alerts would start going off because my PlayStation also likes to go and update itself at night while I'm watching Netflix, which doesn't bother me. I have enough bandwidth to handle it. But uh, the ASA doesn't seem too happy about it and likes to throw alerts to my XI system, which then I get emailed at 11.30 at night and go, hey, no, no, I'm trying to go to bed now. Leave me alone. So what I ended up having to do is come in and look at my NNA system and say, what's going on? Why is this alerting me right now? This really shouldn't be showing up on my network. You know, is some family member doing something strange or what's happening? And uh, it turns out that within about five minutes, I was able to see, oh, okay, the PlayStation spiking bandwidth. Um, 
and my my computer at home is also using quite a bit of bandwidth it's just hitting the alert um, there's nothing I well I ended up changing my PlayStation to use different hours just so that they don't conflict and don't go over the threshold that I have set um, but you can set up various thresholds and actually get um, the data in there and see and along the same lines you can also set it to uh, receive and send SNMP systems or <laughs> systems uh, traps and or gets and if you set up various Nagio servers you can forward your checks and results to those servers um, going back to views real quick just to uh, kind of finish up the correlation bit of it and I'm sorry I've been looking this way so if anyone had a question just yell at me <laughs> Here you can see basically what this does, what views allow you to do, is take a source uh, or a set of sources and save the data for potentially a, an extended period of time or a shorter amount of time, but restrict it to whatever you want to see specifically. So again, if you've got a border firewall, maybe we want to look up uh, RDP traffic. Okay, and let's do port. Uh, what is it 3389 and we'll make it for 24 weeks this will get reset in an hour or two anyways so then we can go add some sources like I said you can add one you can add both and what this will do is create an additional RRD um, that's separate and, and separate data storage from what's already in your current um, sources and allow you to keep this data for, like I said, a shorter or longer period of time that's specific to this particular thing. So if you need to monitor, in this case, HTTP traffic for compliance reasons or RDP traffic just to, um, you know, maybe your PCI um, things force you to do that. You can do these sorts of things. Um, I think that's about all I have. I mean, there's, we can certainly go into NSTI if you want. I can show you, uh, should be this guy. There's not, like I said, there's not a whole lot in NSTI at the moment. Um, I am running the newest version, so it's not flaky, but it doesn't show you everything that you, you could do. Um, we are working on doing some different filtering and trap lists, basically allowing you to configure your own um, traps inside of NSTI, uh, much like when you add a MIB does. Um, otherwise, presently, you're not seeing any normal ones because Microsoft, in their infinite wisdom, don't provide MIBs for uh, uh, events or, or event log traps that they send. They basically like to start everything up all on their own. And uh, let me see if I can find it. So yeah, like these, these enterprise MIBs that you're seeing here, all these wonderful numbers that specify an OID are actually the name of the service turned into their ASCII um, table values. And so yeah, for any particular service, there's no MIB that actually you can import and work with this. You have to create it all by hand. But uh, at some point, that, that'll be in NSTI that we can actually take these unknown MIBs that you don't have, or maybe you have a vendor that you have to pay uh, some sort of exorbitant amount of money to get their MIBs. Well, now you would be able to take the same information from NSTI and actually turn it into um, something that your SNMPT and NSTI can look at and go, oh, I understand what that is. I can send you an alert and let you know what's going on. Um, yeah, I'm pretty well all set. Do you guys have any questions? Um, anything you want me to go over again? Mm-hmm. You can collect the data lots of different ways. So the actual source IP destination as far as the, the number of bytes that were in it. Um, in this particular case, I have a Cisco ASA at home. 
And so that has NetFlow on it by default. Um, NetFlow is a proprietary um, flow by Cisco, but uh, basically that device will take a, I don't want to call it a sample because it's not a sample, but it, it takes a um, summary of my traffic at, at a continual rate and it builds it up for say a minute or five minutes and then it sends it to the NNA box and the NFCAPD is a daemon that runs on the uh, NNA system that actually captures all of that for you. Correct, correct. And actually, it's more of pointing the device at NNA than anything. Right. Yep. And in the case of Windows, um, there are agents that you can run on a Windows box. So say you want to watch where your Exchange server is sending email or things like that. Um, you can certainly do that as well. Um, in, in my particular case, I use it to actually correlate the um, Exchange and who's connecting with their different mobile devices or where they're connecting from and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. That is not, no. That is just specifically uh, a server health statistic on that local host. Correct. Yep, yep, where NNA is running. Um, James? Hey, yeah, you mentioned uh, once you install NSTI that you can send the traps to XI and have it send to NSTI. You, you can create an, a wonderful re uh, circular loop, yep. It's or, great. Or, or uh, the trap will go to NSTI first and then it sends to XI. Mm -hmm. Why? Yeah, that's what. <laughs> yeah, my mind was just exploding for a second because it's setting off light bulbs of why my install may not have gone right. Oh, boy, buddy. So, <laughs> but why would you choose one over the other? I'm, with, um, if you send it to NSTI first, it can actually change the host name that it's sending to XI, correct? I do believe so, yes. And okay, so even more specifically than that, depending on how you're doing it, um, so, so there, there's a couple things that you could be looking at. For one, if you're not running your NSTI server on your XI server, which many people do, um, we don't suggest it, but people do. I do. Put I that do. in the documentation, please. <laughs> right? <laughs> um, if you're not running them on the same server, you have, and even if you are, you do still have the option it, to some extent to change how your SNMP trap handler.py specifically or any other shell script that you may write handles your traps. So if I remember right, in your case, you're actually collecting traps in one spot and forwarding them all to your XI NSTI system? I have a couple that okay. I have a couple systems that send into the XI server, yeah. Yep. And so um, if, you, if each of those were just doing their own traps, it would be pretty trivial to get it to come in correctly. Um, the biggest issue, I think, in, in reference to a similar issue to yours or your issue is, say, people that use other trap collectors, they've got you know, a, a remote data center, and then they use one system to collect all the traps there, yeah, and send it back to um, their own NSTI system. Well, the problem with traps is that they're not smart enough to be able to handle that. So what we have to do, or I believe should be available in NSTI or handling in the traps itself, is to rewrite how those traps are handled and say, there's an additional value or there's this value in the trap that actually does say what host it comes from. I actually have a wrapper on my forwarders yep. so that it comes through with the right host name. And that's exactly what you need to do. Um, that should be the correct way to handle it. Um, the only other reason that it might not is if it's choosing, if your MIB is choosing to ignore that value and still saying, no, you know what, I want to use the actual host it's coming from um, and, and just ignore what it's saying in the, the trap itself, which shouldn't be the case, ideally. We've got about uh, five minutes left here. Any other questions or comments for Spencer? You wanna? Is it, is it? Okay. <laughs> we had just started looking at NSTI. Um, is it fairly straightforward to configure and set up? Or, or um, I take take that as a no. It should be. It it really really should be. It's not as difficult as it is. Or er, 
it's more difficult than it should be because just it's kind of like XI in a way that it's got several moving parts that sometimes just don't quite work correctly. Um, for instance, we'll pick on James again in the back there. Him and another gentleman on our forums have had uh, several issues with it for the past oh, week or two, I would say, and uh, at least. And <laughs> and uh, we, we've worked through a bunch of issues. We've gone through s quite a lot of troubleshooting to try and figure out what's going on. Um, at times it works, and then you know a day, a week later, a uh, system update later, it doesn't work. And in my own writing of this presentation and actually working with version 3, um, for one, part of the issue, especially if you're going to look at version 2, is it uses some Django dependencies for Python that uh, are now updated to a point that the versions that are in use in NSTI 2.0 are use code that's deprecated and or completely unavailable. Um, and so it does create quite an issue there. Um, the difference with 2.5 or 3 or whatever Nick decides to call this is that there are no such dependencies. It's all code that's he's that's he's written that he's written, um, and aside from some, you know, whatever built-in Python functions there are. Um, the install for 3 or whatever the current version I'm using is, is a snap. It's significantly easier. The only wheels that tend to get stuck are uh, SNMP TT itself or TrapD, which are the, the actual handlers from NetSNMP. Do you, do you have any date in terms of availability of 2.5.3.0? Not that I'm willing to give out. <laughs> I, I will say that now that NNA is done and in production, um, that and several other smaller projects are moving to the front of the line. So I wouldn't expect it too long. I know he wants to push it out. It's a project that he finds somehow to be a lot of fun to work on. So, um, and it, the other thing with it is, is it is more of a personal project for him. He doesn't often get time in the office or hasn't for a while. So um, I'm pushing him. I want it. <laughs> There's features that we've talked about, um, he and I have talked and discussed, that uh, are looking to be pretty, pretty great and should be very, very nice to have, especially some of, like I said, the, uh, the adding MIBs or, or adding configurations that don't currently exist regarding like Windows event logs and things. That would be enormously helpful. That just, as far as I know, don't really exist in many other products. But no, unfortunately, I don't have a timeline. Any other uh, quick comments or questions? All right, excellent. Well, let's uh, hear a big round of applause here for Spencer. Thank you.